Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Get Together podcast today with a very special topic. Um, a couple of years ago, I came to my awareness that in the United States, a fund exists. It's called the ARC Fund. Um, founded by Kathy Wood in 2014. And she has um, an investment approach that I very much appreciate. Uh, it's investing in high tech and deep tech companies. And she has put together a research team that is on the lookout for game changing technology since 2014. And the nice thing with her fund and her team is that every year she issues a report, which she calls Big Ideas Report, in which she dissects with her team um, the five platforms of innovation she has identified and of which she believes that they will shape our society in the coming one or two decades. And amongst these platforms of innovation, there is one life science application. Uh, she calls it the genomics revolution and um, everything around gene editing, gene sequencing, um, the therapies connected to what she calls genomics revolutions and also diagnostics um, is analyzed by her team every year. So I asked myself, uh, what is this uh, hype all about, about genomics, CRISPR technology? And there are so many new terms uh, on the market that um, I was looking for experts from my network. And uh, actually, interestingly, I found them here in Vienna, in Austria. Uh, and I'm very happy today that uh, I can welcome to this episode two experts from uh, uh, Vienna, Austria, and uh, Germany. Uh, it's Thomas Moser and Tilman Birkstümer from Alien Biotech. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Hello. Christian, for having us. Great to be here. Good to see you. Let me ask you uh, one initial question first. Um, what is your background? Yeah, if I may start. So <clears throat> my background, background is in, in genetics. So I studied in Salzburg, then I yeah, did my PhD in developmental biology, then went into industry for a few years and then yeah, moved to Vienna to work uh, as a technology licensing office for, uh, officer for Austrian universities, which was a quite interesting task these days. This was late 90s, because this was also the time when the Austrian biotech scene really evolved and I also got drawn into this uh, this uh, field of, of, of seed financing and by my colleagues because we also had a fund that invested into this area and yeah one of the first uh, business plans I got on my table was from Intercell which uh, back in these days yeah made the first financing round so it was really super exciting times and yeah in the the coming years I have grown into this role and, and yeah in the end we we managed our own uh, venture capital fund and invested into early stage uh, companies uh, but after some time I, I went back into the, the operational area again early 2015 I uh, 2014 I, yeah I, I went into the biotech scene again as a operational manager and, and together with Stillman we managed a spin-off of another biotech uh, company called Haplogen Genomics in the area of gene edited uh, cell lines and this startup was reasonably successful yeah within a short time period we we could sell this to Horizon Discovery, UK-based company, which was back in the days really considered one of the main tech company being active in this area of, of gene editing and having a very strong also IP base in this area. Yeah, and then it was quite exciting time where we worked for three years for this UK company. But uh, after some time, as you know, yeah, it's it's interesting to work with these medium-sized to big companies. But after some times, as an entrepreneur, you want to take your 
uh, own fate again and and decide uh, and make it, make the decisions on your on your own. And that's uh, why we we then founded our own company again. Yeah, which we probably will discuss later on. Which was called Beginning eight eight two thousand eighteen. We started Alien Biotechnology, which has uh, developed since then quite quite well. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I completely agree to your statement that uh, working with big corporations is uh, a completely different world than uh, evolving a new idea from the ideation phase into the pre-seed and seed stage and uh, first financing rounds. And uh, it's a different world. Absolutely. Uh, Tillmann, where are you coming from? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a biochemist by training, um, did a PhD in Berlin on, on virology, um, host virus interaction, and then came to Vienna as a postdoc where I joined uh, Julius Operti Furgas lab. Um, and after some time there, um, Julio asked me whether I want to join Haflogen as the first scientist. And that was sort of a very exciting prospect to join um, a newly founded company that back in the days um, was really sort of being built. Um, And so then I spent um, essentially um, three, four years at Haplogen. Um, and that is, was around the time then uh, when, when CRISPR um, came to the scene and we, and we very quickly realized that this was going to be a game-changing technology and, and started using it early in 2013. So the, the, that was really around the time the first papers suggested that this could be used in mammalian cells and very quickly built what back in the days was the largest collection of knockout cell lines um, available sort of to date. And uh, that was then the basis for uh, the acquisition by uh, Horizon Discovery. And then at Horizon, I had um, various roles in, in R&D, essentially um, driving um, technology development. I had sort of teams in Cambridge, teams in Vienna, and um, in the end was in charge of um, innovation across the entire company. Um, which, which was sort of had a US site, a UK site, and, and a site in Vienna. And then sort of recently, as, as Thomas um, pointed out, we bought it off and we, we founded our own company early 2018. And really the main driver there was to get um, back into the driver's seat. I mean, that was really the, the thing that, um, that in, a, in a bigger organization is, you know, if you've, once you've had the privilege, let's say, to work in a small, um, efficient organization where um, decision-making works and, 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 and you're sort of used to that, it, it's not easy to, to find um, yourself uh, in, a, in, a, in a bigger organization where everything needs a committee and, and, and sort of different people weigh in. People point out caveats and then, you know, nothing happens. Um, so we're very much enjoying, I think, that um, um, flexibility and agility that we now have um, back. Amazing points. We are trading safety and security uh, for the excitement of the startup world. So let's yeah. let's put it that way. Uh, you explained uh, that you founded in 2018 your current company. Uh, It's named Alien Biotechnology. Where is the name coming from? Uh, so it, this was a an interesting process to find the name for the company. Basically, it can be tracked back to a, a Greek scholar called Elianus, who was a famous natural scientist that back in the days and who had yeah, did some landmark kind of books in, in of, of uh, characterizing the fauna and flora of the of the ancient Greek and then we felt that this is a, a good a, a good characterization what we do with our our technology base so it's really about going into the mechanisms of life and of cells and, and that's what we can essentially do with our technology base and, and platform therefore we felt this this was quite a suitable name for our company. I like I like all names that begin with A. I think it's uh, <laughs> a tremendous advantage uh, for companies that need to attend conferences because when <laughs> I get the company names listed alphabetically uh, and I want to reach out to, it doesn't matter if it's investor or pharma companies, they always start every conference with A. 
And when there are 2,000 companies uh, at uh, this event, then I end up somewhere at C or something. Yeah. So it always comes to my mind, names beginning with A uh, have an advantage in our world. That's why the companies now start with numbers. This is even more for you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Let's take it up a notch or with a point or with a bracket marks. Yeah, exactly. What is the core focus of Alien Biotechnology? What, 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 what is your business? Yeah, so the core focus is really to bring together these two landmark technologies. One on the, is, is obviously the gene scissors CRISPR technology. I think we will go into detail later on on that. But the other very important part is this, uh, part is this single cell component that uh, forms a an important part of our technology portfolio and we bring this together what this means what does this uh, single cell resolution and revolution mean so if you think of a tumor biopsy uh, then as a biologist you are, or, or a medical doctor you are probably aware that the biopsy uh, that you take from a from a tumor creates many different cell types. So you have some cells that are kind of necrotic, that are, uh, that have died. You have some, some fibrotic uh, tissue, you have different blood cells maybe, and, and you have the, the tumor cells. So if you analyze this whole tumor sample, you always look at the average between all these different cell types. So the analysis in the end is, is somehow Average the signal may be weaker. What you can do with single cell technologies that you really look at each single cell, and uh, this provides superior resolution. And therefore, if you are able to only look at the tumor tissue, uh, you can learn learn a lot from that because the signal is not blurred by by some other cell types that you're not interested in. And what we take this approach one step further in that we perturb genes in uh, single cells and, and look at the consequences this genetic perturbation has on the phenotype uh, of the cell. And what we can do with that is, is really to look for new targets for for new therapeutics with really unprecedented resolution. And that's obviously of very big interest uh, for, for many international, for, uh, international cooperation partners like uh, big pharma companies, biotech companies. I mean, it's a super specialized business. I think we have built a, a very significant know-how in this area, it's very specialized and therefore, yeah, we feel we are on a good good track. I think the kind of uh, secret in, in these days is really to have a kind of special topic that you work on and, and really focus on that. And, and we have built of a team of we are more than 30 people now that really exclusive, exclusively focus on this this very special topic. And, and I feel we really, uh, uh, could create uh, very interesting partnerships through this technology base. Tillman, do you want yeah. to to, yeah, no. to add to this great explanation? No, I think um, Thomas Thomas summarized it very well. It's really the um, the single cell topic, which 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 is sort of which is married, if you like, with um, CRISPR. And I think what's interesting for for a startup. Initially, as they say, you know, it's important that you work in a in a in a relatively small niche because you're very few people. So you need to focus on on something, and ideally, ideally, that something is quite narrow. And then, you know, in our case, we, we sort of started in this space when this when the field was much less developed, and and we were sort of betting on this field um, uh, on on the expansion of this field. And this is what we're really seeing after um, sort of being in this business for two, three years, there's a lot um, of excitement in single cell technologies and people really appreciate that um, we cannot just grind up tissues or grind up cells and sort of average above them, but we really need to learn um, 
sort of from the individual cell what's what's going on um, because these cells differ very much it's like looking at a group of people right you can now say oh we look at uh, all the faces uh, individually or we create sort of an average face the average face will maybe tell you a, a little bit right are we in western europe or in africa so it's not there, there's still information in that but looking at the individual faces will will sort of give you a lot more flavor and will reveal um, a lot more information and then the other bit is really the the crispr allows us to um, provide causative data and that's very important and very powerful because a lot of the other um, techniques that are out there you know for instance, single cell sequencing on its own is, is essentially a descriptive technology. It's a technology that, that looks at you know, cellular properties, reports the cellular properties, but they really are, there, there is no sort of way to say why a cell developed in this way or developed in another way. What CRISPR allows us to do is change gene expression, change one gene in a cell very specifically and look at the functional consequences of that. So that um, you know, establishes then a causative relationship between that gene and the change we observe. And, and such data are still very scarce, right? A lot of people out there, even in the target um, discovery and target validation space, they will look at large epidemiological studies, they will look at population genetics, they will look at you know, often very biased starting points like, oh, let's look at the papers that people have published in the past five years. But to have an unbiased start, provide a, a data set that, that provides causative relationships, that I think is very strong. And, um, and that's why we're seeing sort of growing interest in our um, technology from sort of pharma and biotech companies. That's, that's amazing. Um... Let's. You mentioned a little bit um, the business side of life uh, in in your opening speech, and let's before we dive deeper into CRISPR and uh, gene editing and gene sequencing, uh, let's dive a little bit also into the business model of uh, life science companies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming from business background and. Uh, started to learn more about this B2B value chain in 2006 when I joined Nobriva and Novartis spin out. Um, and the first few years in life science were scary because it's a very, very unique value chain and a very, very unique, um, let's say, uh, sort of business models that I, I learned to appreciate. But unfortunately, they are not very well documented. So it would be really great uh, to get more insights into how you have set up the business side of alien uh, biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, this is the, one of the most important points in, in when we formed our company and we, we gave this significant uh, consideration. Yeah, so as you already pointed out in biotech, there are many, many different business models. And yeah, also in my life as an investor, I so saw many many companies and many different business models so obviously yeah if you do it on your own you you want to make it better than others so so we have set up alien as it is and and this basically at least where we stand for now is is a status where we perform this uh, functional genomic screens as we we call it uh, for uh, big pharma and biotech companies and we we get a certain chunk of the of the value chain of these results of these screens and uh these screens are as, as we said before these are typically used for for target discovery so you can find new points and, and proteins within the cell where therapeutics can be uh, developed and you learn also a lot about uh, mechanisms uh, of disease so on the one side, we can generate these data and results out of the screens. And on the other side, obviously, we are a very specialized technology platform company. We develop sustainable intellectual property out of these uh, screens because yeah, this whole field, obviously, as you can imagine, is, high, is developing at uh, a very high speed. So the best organizations on the east and west coast are active in the in this area and, and have a focus on this. So the the pressure on, on staying ahead is, is really 
uh, significant. But uh, as we have a very focused team in this this area, we we can afford uh, doing that and really yeah staying staying on top of the technology development. Yeah, so that's basically our our business model. We obviously yeah generate uh, cash flows and revenues in in the project with our international customers. It's a very international business, so I think we only have one one customer in in, in continental Europe. It's really the main markets in US, UK, Japan, where our corporation partners are located. And and yeah, with these we we typically work on a project basis of let's say yeah typical projects uh have a duration of let's say nine to eighteen months and within such uh such projects we we develop uh develop these this technology further and, and generate the results that we described before yeah and, may, and maybe to add to this i think we um there are always there are always different ways to to sort of um make a business out of technology and um one other one other um sort of recent development that we're very excited about is that we that we founded a spin-off a daughter company um together with a cambridge uk based biotech named um, bitbio and in this daughter company we sort of carved out a a particular area in this uh, in this specific case um, it's stem cell biology there's a lot of um, and, and and growing interest in human stem cells um, for various applications um, certainly for gene and cell therapy but also as um, research models and and tools and and we said you know the technology that we have developed at alien um, has sort of very interesting, applications in this space and and this application has gotten so big um, that together with a partner we're actually setting up um, a separate vehicle a separate company and and within that company where we're both um, managing directors as well we're really um, driving the development of novel um, stem cell types um, that that can well not, not stem cell types novel cell types as they can be obtained um, um, from stem cells and and that vehicle, because if it was such of such great interest to us and to our partners in in Cambridge, um, sort of was then was then co-funded um, by the partner in Cambridge. Um, so we think that's that that's that's another interesting way of sort of getting technology funded. It it, it it can be sort of projects that run for a certain duration and then they end, but it can be that these projects become big and important enough so that you can actually. Um, set up a separate company with a dedicated team that will grow um, this additional application of the technology and that secures separate funding in this entity. That's great to hear. Congratulations. Uh, so you did it twice. Uh, won the first foundation in 2018, uh, back into the startup world. And then the second one, which year was it? Yeah, the second this one was, was in September, yeah. September last year only. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's somehow it's somehow linked so so mm. kind of <laughs> so it's not a real foundation side. <laughs> no i mean although it's it's a separate company it's mm. a separate mm. entity and, and obviously you have to yeah recruit the team there and and uh but we felt in this very special case that that this really makes sense uh to form an own entity really for the work to be done in in stem cells and and cell types derived from the stem cells because maybe this should be mentioned that we, as well that kind of the bracket that keeps all the work at alien together as well is really this focus on cellular models that are highly physiologically relevant what we mean by that is that the cellular models we work with we feel are much better suited than the typically used immortalized cancer line the cancer lines that are used in in in, uh, in pharma and biotech uh, research and development. So the goal really is to have something, a, a model that can be well translated into human uh, into human trials in the end with a much higher prob probability than this uh, typically used cancer cell lines, which in many cases have mm -hmm. very weird uh, genomes, have lots of mutations, 
even the fact that they grow unlimited is is not not natural every cell that you take out of the human body is typically quite limited in lifespan so so this is an, an important focus of of our work as well i mean which means that's super challenging because on the one side in alien we work in, in primary t cells so you take blood from the patient extract these uh, these cells and cultivate them so you can easily imagine that's very challenging but uh, we have managed these uh, these uh, this uh, uh, very tough points and and our team yeah has established the systems and therefore yeah we can perform our kind of other technologies now in these advanced cell models that's great so basically you, instead of um say founding a second division in your company you decided to spin it out uh, get it financed separately yeah. and keep with both entities your particular core focus on the market so that right. the storytelling is not diluted with uh, with an approach that might when we look at it in one company uh, might a little bit uh, raise questions why it yeah. is uh, in, in, in one part. Yeah. Um, when I understand your approach, uh, it's a B2B business model uh, yeah. in which you are, uh, uh, let's say, accumulating expertise in the company, in the field around these two topics of your companies. And then you approach the pharma industry mm -hmm. and enter into research collaborations with them, which I assume is not, uh, let's say, a week or so. Uh, am I right with my assumption that these are multi years collaborations down the road that uh, are consist of several projects and are not yeah. uh, let's say like buying a used car so that you uh, no. approached once so they really want to to understand get your expertise in the fields that they don't have right um do you and i also assume that the take over the expenses and the cost uh do you also participate in the upside i mean um if something evolves into a product mm -hmm. later on yeah and existing partnerships we don't have this yet but you're making a, a very good point. Obviously, this is the goal for the future that we participate in the downstream value creation in terms of yeah percentages of milestones and, and also maybe royalties. Uh, but this is a bit dependent on the phase, phase of the company. Obviously, in the beginning, it was important uh, for us to get Alien off the ground and mm -hmm. really establish ourselves as a major technology player in this very special field. and And we have gained significant traction in the meantime. I mean, yeah, recently we could uh, we could communicate that yeah, we are doing three large projects with, with GSK. And, Congratulations. Uh, yeah, this was really a major, major step forward uh, for Alien. And this also probably gives us a lot of uh, credibility. Uh, but as you rightly pointed out, this these are long projects that take take many months uh, and and also involve a lot lot on our side and yeah in in the next projects that we will get on board definitely this participation on the downstream side is important for us in addition the the improvement of the technology base is a value on its own so we obviously apply for patents uh, in this this space certain Patents on on parts of the workflow mm -hmm. uh, have been uh, have been applied for, and, and they contribute to to this building of a sustainable value position for for Alien. Besides this other leg that Tillman already mentioned, forming forming joint ventures with specialized partners for for specific topics, which has on, already been exemplified for the stem sets, but that could also be true for certain therapeutic areas. Yeah, IP protection should not be underestimated. So it can create a really nice mode around the business and, and drive the value when the IP strategy is set up very well, especially if it's a new field, which uh, I consider CRISPR and gene editing still is, uh, yeah. um, uh, still is rather new and uh, mostly unprotected. Um, when, I, when I think about the typical startup that I meet at incubation or acceleration programs these days, uh, 
first to present the business plan and the second their will to reach out to investors for investment and what i find interesting in your story it sounds to me that you did it the other way around so i mean you established your expertise your business plan and then went right to the customer or did they overhear that you also uh were in talks with investors and got investment money what was your strategy in funding the the initial days yeah, of the yeah. we were a, a, in a kind of very privileged position on the on the one side this was not our first company so we have seen lots of companies before before and then have gained significant experience before and also as i said before our three years at working for this uh, uk based horizon discovery company was really kind of very important times for us because we could really uh, expand our international networks to to customers to distribution partners and obviously this this helped us in in setting up up uh, alien later on then so in terms of financing we did not uh, really make big financing rounds we have a bit of business uh, money, business angel money on board which which comes from a yeah i would say a friend uh, and besides that we don't have uh, institutional institutional capital on board uh, because we were in this kind of uh, privileged position that we really could fund us right from the beginning with significant uh, project money coming from our cooperation partners. But yeah, obviously this would not rule out that in one of the maybe JVs that we plan for the future then that we bring in, uh, we see money there for yeah for certain uh, therapeutic developments that could be done in such a Total company. I mean, for the time being, I, I would add, we're really enjoying the fact that we have independence there. We 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 don't have um, a board or in you know investors that we that we need to meet on a monthly basis, provide reports, you know, answer questions. Right? We can really decide um, what we think is right for the company. Um, on the other hand, it means that we are focusing on the clients this is i think this is um this is also a good point because it's um it, it allowed us sort of from the first day to get real world feedback right we, we were not in a position to develop something for two three years only to learn that nobody really needs this right we were we were de because we were dependent on money flowing in from people that want to work with us we had to be sure that what we're developing is, is sort of in a very short period of time going to be, um, um, well, maybe not monetized, but is going to be needed, right? So, so a lot of our developments are guided um, by customer needs. And because we have that direct interaction from day one, um, we're really not falling into the trap of developing something that we think is incredibly cool um, and then it maybe isn't. Um, Test, testing the market is always a good idea. I got my training in the 90s and the typical business model um, back then was um, develop a prototype, find a customer. So <laughs> once you have the first customer, it's validation enough and then look for growth capital. When I look at uh, the investment world today, especially in the early days, I think it's a little bit the upside down. It's uh, develop a pitch deck, find an investor, and then hopefully you come to a prototype and later on you find a customer or other investors. So it's an interesting direction. Um, however, what I, what, what I saw when I entered the life science industry, I mean, of course, scientists were excited about new technologies. It uh, helped to improve their processes, their product development processes. Uh, that's, that's, that's cool. But in 2014, 15, 16, and especially in 18 and 19, this um, CRISPR and gene editing uh, did something amazing um, compared to other technologies. I mean, other technologies mostly stay hidden and uh, the, the usual uh, retail investor from the streets or the usual investment fund is not very interested in that. Not so with CRISPR and not so with gene editing and gene sequencing, as I uh, said in the uh, initial uh, in the in the opening of the podcast episode, uh, the ARC funds, uh, huge fan of uh, the genomics revolution. 
Uh, can you explain to the average investor a little bit what this excitement is all about? Why gene editing is so different uh, to other technologies in our industry? Yeah, I can I can try that. So essentially, the you know we know sort of since the completion of the Human Genome Project, which was first sort of completed um, in two thousand one, I believe. Um, what we know since the completion of the human genome is we know the, the building blocks of the of the cell and of the human body, the so-called genes, right? And we have 20,000 of them. And we essentially know that drugs act on gene products. So they, they um, take a product, a protein in a cell that is encoded by a gene and they modulate it. And as a consequence of that, we can treat disease. But, you know, until the advent of CRISPR, we really had no way of manipulating genes, let's say in a faithful way. There were, there were sort of other technologies out there that could try to do this, you know, for the aficionados, this was RNA interference. It sort of worked a little bit, but not really. And, and what's exciting about CRISPR is that we're now able to do this. And this gives us sort of two, I think, angles that are, that are, that, or two opportunities that we couldn't tap into. One is, you know, for the researchers in the lab, we can now, ask what does that gene do in a cell right it's a very fundamental question and and if i have a hypothesis as to whether this gene is a target of a drug i can i can ask does it does sort of targeting this gene or targeting this gene product does that make a good drug right and that's super important because the drug discovery process is a very long one it takes sort of you know if it's not the covid vaccine it, it, it usually takes sort of something like 10 years to go from nominating a target to having a drug um, on the market, if not longer. And so the, the nomination at the beginning is, is sort of the critical starting point. And if you don't get it right at that point, you will do 10 years of you know, medicinal chemistry and toxicology and you name it, but, but the drug will not do what it's supposed to do. So sort of that is the, the first angle that I think is, is super exciting that we now have a tool that at least conceptually or potentially allows us to nail the most important drug targets and thereby increase the chance of a drug to be successful. The second is if you want to if you want to take that thought a little further, you know, in basic biology or in basic science, it's very similar. We, we you know, people are looking at a process, let's say you're a researcher studying uh, diabetes, right? You suddenly have a way of finding out whether a gene has a role in diabetes or not. That's what the basic science uses, uses CRISPR for. And then sort of the future of, of CRISPR is really sort of, is, is really not only as a tool to discover new drugs, but is, you know, CRISPR could become the drug itself. So we could face a situation where you have a, you, you know, the, the, probably the simplest model is you have a gene defect, right? You might you might have um, sickle cell anemia. That's that's a common one that people are interested in these days. It's a blood disorder, so your 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 blood cells sort of in, in this case your red blood cells um, are dysfunctional, and they're dysfunctional because you have an error in your genome in a particular gene. And this error, you know, people know for decades, but there's nothing you can do about it. Right? That's the that's the sad thing. It's and it, it, it's very similar about many other hereditary disorders, right? You find out your kid has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you, you can precisely map it to the mutation, but there's nothing you can do about it. And, and the exciting prospect about CRISPR is you might be able to correct this mistake, if you like, or this error in the genome and thereby cure disease. Of course, there's a lot of technical hurdles in the way, so it will not be something that will happen tomorrow, but at least conceptually, that's why it's so exciting. Any, any disease that's caused by a defect in a gene, and there are many of those, many of um, those that we know and that, that a lot of people have heard of, you know, cystic fibrosis. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long list. It's hundreds, if not thousands of, of disorders. Um, those we can potentially treat and potentially cure um, with CRISPR. And, and that is just un, unheard of. Um, there was no sort of similar development, I would say, in, in, a, in a long period of time um, that opened up such a vast field um, as gene editing did. 
mean, maybe to add to this also from a mechanistic point of view, the system is very elegant and relatively easy to use. I mean, there were systems around that could be used for similar purposes for editing the genome very specifically, but these were complicated and very specific. And with CRISPR, you basically have a protein that is kind of programmed by a sh short stretch of of a nucleic acid, which can be easily synthesized in any lab. And you bring this together, if, if you tell it uh, very simply, and you can uh, you can make a genome edit. And, and this ease of access also contributed to this hype, hype around this uh, CRISPR editing that only can be compared to polymerase chain reaction, this, this uh, gene amplification that yeah, <laughs> also was, was maybe the, the latest landmark uh, invention in, in biology before CRISPR. So when I put it bluntly, on one hand, uh, there is excitement uh, about the diagnostics and understanding the development of diseases better, uh, especially those that are rooted in genetics and have their causes so that you really can trace back uh, which gene plays which role in what disease at what point of the development of the disease. And the second is that you correct it so that you uh, go into the therapeutics field and uh, say, okay, when we identify the problem, why not solve it? Um, when was all this developed? What is the what is the history of of, of gene editing? I don't I don't think it it comes out of nowhere that uh, in 2013 suddenly uh, someone woke up and said, "Let's do gene editing." Uh, can you give a little bit more information on the history of uh, this technology? Yeah. So so the history, you know, very briefly is that already quite some time ago people noticed that in in bacteria there are certain regions that contain repeats and. You know, people found these these repeats and they were not quite sure what they were and what they were for. But already quite early on, people suspected that these might have to do with immunity. And, and, and sort of one key insight was then that absolute repeat is essentially a 20 base pair sequence in the genome that is sort of duplicated. But between those repeats, there were sequences. And, and when people first um, sequenced those, they realized that these sequences between those repeats came from bacteriophages. Now, bacteriophages are essentially the viruses that infect bacteria. So that sort of meant, um, or, or that sort of strongly pointed to these repeats being involved in, in immunity, right? Because these are sequences found in a bacterium, but they're not from the bacterium, they're from the phage that infects the bacterium. So it sort of reminds us of, of immunity that that you know much like we know it um, um, sort of um, in humans, and then um, the key insight came um, really that that sort of got this entire field um, um, to to sort of heat up and and become very exciting um, came from the discovery that there was an enzyme. This is the, the enzyme called Cas9, and what this enzyme could do is it could take these sequences that you know in the bacterium come from the bacteriophage and they could essentially trigger a DNA double strand break in a sequence that's complementary to the sequence inserted between the repeats. So what that meant is if the phage comes in, you know, the bacterium has seen that phage before, remembers it because that sequence is integrated between those repeats. It can take those sequences, mash them to the phage DNA and the phage gets destroyed. It gets cut and cleaved by this enzyme Cas9. That was sort of the key, the key piece of the puzzle. And, and sort of people had figured parts of the puzzle out um, before. Um, obviously, it was sort of an entire field with, with a lot of people contributing. But the key insight for which then Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna were no awarded the Nobel Prize um, last year was they were able to take all the components that were needed in the system and make them in vitro. So make the Cas9 endonuclease in bacteria, make a so-called guide RNA. This is this, this RNA molecule with, with the repeat sequences, put that together in a, in a Petri dish or in, a, in that case, in an Eppendorf tube and show that this could trigger programmed targeted cleavage of the reaction that is um, of the of the DNA that's complementary to the to the guide RNA that you put in. So 
they sort of identified the minimal components of the system and said, this is, this is what we need to make it work. And then obviously people could take this very quickly and make it work in human cells, in plant cells, in animal cells, and so on and so forth. But that key insight, that was really um, what got the field started. This is a paper they published late in 2012. It's actually work initiated um, here in Vienna um, by um, um, Chris Jelinski, PhD student in uh, Emmanuel Charpentier's lab when she was still in Vienna. But then the work sort of was completed um, when she was in Sweden. Um, and, and, and there was sort of a, a partner effort at, uh, at Berkeley where um, Jennifer Doudna um, was based together with her PhD student, Martin Ginek, who is today a professor in Zurich. That's, that's amazing. So Vienna um, seems to play a key role in that field. Um, when I look at uh, the community, you are here, then you mentioned uh, Haplogen, the company that uh, was also, I think, 2013 uh, established. And then the company CRISPR Therapeutics is also uh, run by uh, Rod Konobak. And uh, I think Emmanuel Charpentier is also still on the board of the company. Um, why is Vienna so attractive? Uh, is this uh, just pure luck or uh, coincidence? Or is there um, a special reason why, why, why CRISPR is, uh, is leaving such a heavy impact on the industry here? Yeah, I mean, first, I would not like, I mean, as much as I like Alien and Haptogen, I think to name them in, in the same um, sort of um, row as, as CRISPR Therapeutics or Emmanuel Charpentier is a bit of a big pair of shoes to wear. Um, no, I think it's essentially the just coincidence that you're all in the yeah. same city. <laughs> no, I, I think it is to some extent it is coincidence. Obviously, the fact that mm -hmm. um, Rod Ganovac was involved in and, and Emmanuel when, when Arin is involved in, in CRISPR therapeutics is because Emmanuel had such an important role in discovering that. I think you could say that it was important for Vienna to have um, this this sort of this group at the at the university, not only Emmanuel's group, but also sort of Pavel Kovarik, um, Thomas Decker, people that were focusing on bacterial genetics, right? That was that was sort of the key subject. These people didn't didn't start to discover a novel gene editing tool, right? In particularly Emmanuel, she was a bacterial geneticist trying to understand what these repeats do in, in the bacterium, trying to understand bacterial immunity, if you like. Um, so I think in, in that sense, um, that is probably Vienna's contribution, right? That they had this focus on bacterial genetics and that then whatever we learned um, from bacterial genetics could be translated and became uh, a tool that, that, that now we're using um, for a different purpose. Um, so yeah, I think that is, um, um, it's, that, that was quite important. And, and the University of Vienna obviously is still involved um, because um, the, the intellectual property, which is the foundational IP, let's say, around the world, is still partly owned by the University of Vienna together with Berkeley and, and Emmanuel on her own, which is, is, is another interesting detail because she moved to Sweden. Mm -hmm. In Sweden, academic researchers retain full rights on, their, on the IP they discovered, which is different from the situation here, right? If you're a professor at the university and you make an important discovery, that is typically owned by the university. You get a share of that typically, but you don't own it, right? Whereas in, in Sweden, it's, it's, it's the other way around. So because she had moved to Sweden, which is probably the only place that has such an IP, uh, right? She actually personally owns that IP, um, you know, up to, this day and um and and obviously that had a, a significant um, financial impact positive financial impact for um, emmanuel i assume i think it's uh, very interesting to learn more about uh ip protection different ip protection strategies especially uh in the area of basic research um and it's really interesting um what i really like uh, is to see how such ideas evolve so first you have a small group to start working on it and if it works then uh the industry just gets bigger and bigger and more companies evolve and more researchers are drawn in and uh everything grows naturally and and effortlessly 
Uh, it's also interesting to hear Vienna in the, uh, in the same sentence with uh, Berkeley, for example, University of Vienna. It's um, there, There's a lot going on here in the city and uh, in, in the heart of Europe, which is uh, not so obviously marketed like digital advancements or app development. So I really like that. When I think about gene editing, um, I think um, when we're uh, looking at the yellow press, there's also a lot of uh, fear and uh, discussions around that, if this is really good, uh, if it's risky or dangerous. Uh, can we talk a little bit about real life applications? So what this, uh, just to, to give people more insight, what can we really do with gene editing and what is more on the superstitious side or on the, on the fear-based side and not really realistic? Um, what are some applications that you think about that this technology can uh, really grow into? Yeah, I mean, apart from the functional genomics, which is what we are doing, sort of trying to understand the functions of genes I think the biggest um, hope is that we should, one day we will be able to cure disease. You know, it's obvious as you as you just pointed out um, that this pertains to genetic disorders. We've we've talked about that a little bit, but it's also true that we might potentially treat cancer, and that is, you know, cancer also has certain dependencies on certain genes more than others, um, and we might be able to. Um, to use CRISPR to switch off these, these genes that are either driving or supporting a cancer cell and thereby eliminate um, cancer. Um, uh, there is a lot of interest in, in an area called immuno-oncology, where mm -hmm. um, what we can do is we can essentially take the blood from a patient or take immune cells as they reside in a tumor, and we can, we can change them with CRISPR to sort of reawaken them, right? That they're, they're typically not very active against the tumor. That's part of the strategy, if you like, of the tumor to make them sort of not recognize the tumor because the tumor in principle is something that's that that in an ideal world would be considered foreign so that the that the body gets rid of the tumor. But of course the tumor has sort of if you think of it in, in evolutionary terms, the tumor has an interest to stay hidden so that it can grow and it does not get attacked by immune cells. But these immune cells can be reawakened and there, and there are ways to do this with antibodies. Um, they're, they're very famous uh, examples of, of antibodies and that was sort of the, the basis um, for the Nobel Prize given in 2018 for antibodies that if you give them to people that reawaken these immune cells, but there is also a potential um, because blood cells are readily available, right? You can take them out of the body. You could CRISPR engineer them and put them back into the body. There is a, there is excitement about this opportunity. And that is, I think, one of the things that is on the, on the near-term horizon that we might actually um, get sort of our customized tumor treatment where people take the cells out, reprogram them with CRISPR, put them back in. Um, the thing that people are obviously afraid of is, is manipulation of the germline. So that means um, changing the sperm cells or oocytes so that we give rise to genetically engineered human beings. Um, this has apparently been done in China, and there was a lot of there was a, there was an outcry for good reasons um, uh, about this. I don't think neither, neither first I don't think this was a particularly good example because the researchers eliminated a receptor that um, um, uh, typically allows um, HIV to enter cells. So it's there, there are many different ways to treat HIV these days. So it's not needed to manipulate the genome of, of these babies so that they cannot get HIV um, anymore. Um, so I think for the time being, there is a moratorium. Nobody Nobody is advocating the use of CRISPR in the germline. Um, I think that that is that is the state of the of the affairs, um, and I think it's good like that, right? We need to understand better the risks um, associated, um, and, and with risks, I mean, you know, this is a is a you know, CRISPR is sometimes described as a genome scissor, so you can imagine that the scissor comes in and it cuts somewhere, but then you know, if the scissor is not so precise, it might cut somewhere else in the genome, which would mm. potentially cause harm. Um, and so that needs to be looked at very carefully um, before people consider something like um, germline treatment. So it's, I think it's, um, it's not on the horizon really, and there's nothing to be afraid of at this point because the entire scientific community is acting very responsibly about it. There are clear bans 
um, and and you know that is 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 not a risk at this point. I think it's uh, very interesting this this idea that you pointed out um, of let's say reprogramming antibodies. Um, to which can help just put it bluntly reprogramming anybody to take it out of the body and uh uh let's say uh give them a clear order how they should act in the body and which could evolve into the potential of making cancer a manageable disease so it must not be uh that patients then die from cancer but simply can live and can manage the disease and stop it from growing or also re maybe also reverting the process so that it really uh It's driven, let's say it's driven out of the body uh, in, in, in simple words. Uh, is that really a feasible goal? Do you see, do you see this, uh, this direction that it really evolves into um, therapeutics that really have an impact or is it just uh, more like a combination therapy that you still have to use the toxins? I think, there, I think it's a really realistic opportunity. Obviously, we've seen the admission of the first so-called CAR therapies. Mm -hmm. These are T cells which are reprogrammed with an antibody on the surface so that they recognize a tumor cell that they could previously not recognize. And so these therapies are given to patients and for particular types of cancer, particularly cancers of the B cell lineage, so that, that, that arise from antibody producing cells, um, these types of therapies are, you know, I would say quite good. Um, However, I don't think realistically now with the therapies that, that are being developed, there will not be an easy route into sort of um, a cure for, for cancer as a whole, right? Cancer is, is, is a very heterogeneous disease depending on where it arises. But even then, if you look at all the breast cancers, there are some that are quite manageable these days with drugs and others are really poorly manageable. And, um, To, to think that there will be one treatment that sort of one for all, I mean, that's that I don't think is realistic, but to, um, I think the sort of since the discovery of CRISPR, the field of um, cell therapy, so to think of a cell as a therapeutic agent, right? That is sort of, I think a concept that with the advent of CRISPR is becoming a reality. And, and you know, we're seeing more and more examples of, I would say, clinical trials where, um, where people explore the feasibility of that. And, and my, my anticipation is that in five years' time, we'll have a bunch of these, and in 10 years' time, we'll have more. So it's, it's a growing field, and um, the prospect is very exciting. So the prospect is that we might actually be able to um, treat diseases, because, because there are clearly cases um, Well, we've not made a lot of progress. I mean, there are cancer types, there are particular cancers where, you know, we've, we've developed targeted therapies, you know, chronic myeloid leukemia, for instance, was a disease that was very difficult. The entire, let's say, blood cancers. Um, we've really seen a lot of um, improvement over the past sort of 10, 20 years in, in median survival. So we, we're a lot better at managing those diseases. And then there are other areas where we're really, really not doing well. Uh, you know, many of the brain cancers, glioblastoma, for instance, is 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 really really still as bad as we were 30 years ago. We've seen very little progress, um, to my understanding, and um, and the hope is that in, in some of these areas, at least, CRISPR-based um, therapies might um, provide novel opportunities. Yeah, I find the point interesting that you mentioned uh, the the drug that cures everything or all, all cancer types. So it always reminds me of J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, the, the one ring that binds them all. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't, I don't think that this will ever evolve. So that one, one therapy can be used for everything. I, I see it more like uh, adding uh, additional tools to the toolbox of physicians so that they can treat their patients better on a more personalized way. Uh, rather than hoping that uh, the cure everything drug that also makes pretty and rich uh, comes to the market. <laughs> I don't see that coming. Um, let's go a little bit uh, further down the superstitious road. Uh, I really liked it. So for example, the Marvel Universe with all the superheroes that can uh, that can fly and uh, have superpowers and super strengths. And uh, this, I think, is one fear on the market or one hope on the market so that you can go to... Uh, 
to your physician and say, mm, today I would like to fly. Can you uh, edit my uh, genome a little bit so that uh, <laughs> I can ignore gravity and the laws of physics? Uh, is something really possible that uh, the Marvel Universe is coming to life with gene editing or is this just, um, just, just, just a fear that, isn't, that should not be taken so seriously? I, I would say yes and no. Um, I think the, the, the problem with CRISPR, as with any cell and gene therapy, is always delivery. Meaning, you know, if, if, if you could do something, if you could get access to certain cells, then you could potentially manipulate them and you could potentially improve them, right? So I give you an example of that. There is at least suspicion in, the, in, the, in sports that, you know, people, instead of taking erythropoietin, which is one of the drugs that people take, to um, improve their fitness, they might actually take, sort of deliver, they might actually deliver erythropoietin through molecular biology, right? And that's totally plausible for a molecular biologist to, to, to see that. You don't even need CRISPR for that. You might take a virus that makes erythropoietin and you put that into the blood cells of an athlete. It will have very similar effect as taking um, um, as taking that drug, right? So it's, it, it, I think it's possible, but here, you know, in, in the case of the athlete, you know, you do this in a blood cell. So in a blood cell, I think it's feasible because you can access the blood. There is also a, a sort of potentially a safety, a safety net, if you like, um, because, because you could potentially take the blood out, do the treatment, and only when it's safe, you put it back. Now, I'm not advocating that <laughs> we do this with, um, with erythropoietin for, for sportsmen, but I'm trying to illustrate that you can manipulate the blood potentially, and you could potentially create superhumans if you wanted to stay in that in that uh, picture. Um, with a lot of other things, it's it's very difficult. With a lot of other traits, it's very difficult to envisage that, right? If you think you could make someone more intelligent, right? If you believe that intelligence resides in the brain, which we possibly all believe, then then you would need to get something into the brain and you would potentially need to affect a lot of cells and, and a complicated wiring. So to believe that a simple change in a cell, you know, would change your ability to, to be, um, you know, to, to think, let's say that is that I find that very unrealistic. Um, so I think that the main limitation will be on the one hand, our understanding of, of the process. And, and if you stay in the example of intelligence, that's probably a very complicated thing to understand. It's regulated by a lot of different genes. It's regulated by the environment, their genetic changes, epigenetic changes. To believe that there you could make one change and suddenly become super intelligent is, is close to impossible or at least very unlikely. But a simple change coupled uh, like, you know, presence or absence of erythropoietin coupled with an accessible tissue like the blood, I think that's a, that's a possibility. And, and, and obviously that's why then organizations like um, NADA, which are looking at drug abuse in sports, have started to look at that because it's a, it's a possibility. And they're, they might be a few years behind the, the athletes in that, in that sense, but they will look at that and, uh, uh, they will hopefully sort of find these cases and and make sure they don't happen. Um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, interesting ideas on the market these days. So one idea is from Elon Musk, and I think also Jeff Bezos is buying into that, uh, flying to the moon or flying to the Mars and uh, putting a colony on, on Mars. And it reminds me of a book I have read uh, when I was a teenager it was a science fiction book about uh written for teens um about uh, a family who traveled to a to a distant planet and uh, with a little bit let's say a different environments than the earth and it was um hardly survivable for for adults because they didn't have uh, proper genetics for that but uh the kid was uh, genetically engineered uh, to live in a hostile environment like um, normal human beings on the planet, um, which when I listen to Elon Musk, uh, where he says, okay, the future of the human race is uh, in the stars and we have to leave the planet some point in time uh, to, to ensure the survival of our race. It, would it be possible in future, what do you think, so that you can uh, create genetically enhanced human beings uh, that can also survive uh, conditions on other planets that are currently um, let's say a little bit hostile. Oh, let's not think uh, too scientifically, uh, to, 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 to uh, science fiction 
scientifically. Uh, for example, also on Earth, I mean, um, we have this climate uh, climate change that everybody's talking about. Would it be possible to also, over generations, um, develop the genome in a way that um, we don't have to fear uh, our race to go extinct? Is that a possible application or is this uh, still science fiction? Well, I think first, you know, personally, I'm more worried about technology killing the human race than <laughs> technology is <laughs> saving us. But, but maybe that's my pessimism. But then I think what's what possible is, for instance, you know, genetics determines your tolerance to heat. Right? It's clear mm -hmm. that there is a genetic component to that. I I haven't looked into that, but I suspect it's not just one gene that has a very strong effect, but it's sort of or one snip, um, one one sort of small change, but it's multiple. So I think. If that were known, it's it's not it's not unthinkable that we create humans that can tolerate cold much more. If you think of you know going to Mars, maybe we want someone that can tolerate heat uh, better. Or so. Mm -hmm. so it's I think that if you if you really think in the future, I think it's it's uh, it's a possibility. Um, again, at this point, I would I would question. If, if if you sort of want to make very few changes to the genome and that would sort of be dictated by caution right you just want to i think if you if you made too many changes you're worried about messing something up fundamentally but if you wanted to make very few changes in the genome then you would um you would need to understand what those changes are that you need to make and those few changes let's say if you allow five those five changes would have to have a significant impact which you know if you stay in the example of heat and cold, I would suspect it's a lot more SNPs that, that give rise to that. But I think at least conceptually, it is possible that we get to a point where we have, you know, with more and more genomics data coming in, where we have a good understanding of the small changes that, that make, you know, the Inuit more cold resistant um, than us, let's say, and that we could engineer such a property um, back into our genomes to, to sort of potentially save us from... Uh, uh, from climate change, uh, right? That's I think it's potentially possible. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, the, the ideas you have are great. Uh, on one hand, understanding disease better. Um, so when not, not genetic, but um, the, the entire genomics field to understand where it's coming from, what happens with diseases, to go into therapeutics, and so also uh, curing diseases or enhancing human beings. Why not? I would not be worried about it. Uh, when I look at the growth rate of uh, the human race, I think... Uh, don't, don't correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's doubled in the last 40 years or something, and it's still growing. Um, so we run into, when, when you look at agriculture, for example, I think uh, it, it's it's obvious that at some point in time we run into a shortage of, uh, of nutrition. Uh, could gene editing play a role in this area? Yeah, I think potentially I would say yes. Again, my, my personal feeling is that there is a lot more we could do without gene editing to feed the world. But um, if you wanted to look at that angle, I think, you know, in agriculture, we're sort of facing this, this weird situation that if we're making crops with ionizing radiation, like mm. x-rays, right? we're shooting x-rays at plants um, to, to, to sort of create superior variants, um, then, then this is sort of not considered genetic engineering. Whereas if we apply CRISPR or sort of other means, to make uh, a, a plant, then this is considered gen genetic engineering. So um, I think that I, I think particularly in Europe, people are quite resistant to the use of um, genetic engineering, and um, and I think rightfully demand that that this is declared. I would totally subscribe to that. That that the consumer can decide whether or not they would like to eat a genetically modified. Tomato. At the same time, you would like to educate people that if the other tomato that they eat is a, is engineered with X-rays, that that is probably not much better. Um, but anyway, I think um, to come back to that question, we can um, definitely enhance um, plants to become, for instance, resistant to um, certain um, pathogens, to become resistant to heat. Um, right. Mm -hmm. That's another you know, we're, or, or become more resistant to extreme weather conditions. Those are um, things we could potentially build in and, and we, could, we could always build them in, right? With the use of x-rays, as I just said. So people have done that for the past 50 years. 
but it's very costly and laborious and time consuming process. So the hope would be that if we have an understanding of where these favorable traits are encoded, that we can make these changes much faster and we can then get um, to the plants that, um, that we like and that have superior attributes. Um, so I think gene editing um, can help there. And, and, and I, would, I would even say that I would prefer eating a gene edited tomato that was made with CRISPR over an X-ray tomato, possibly. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's another um, interesting and exciting um, area of, of the technology that, um, that um, I'm, yeah, again, I'm not sure to, to what extent this will, this will allow um, us to feed the world because of course, all of these crops, particularly genetically engineered crops, they will be accessible to us, right? You and me, they will not be accessible necessarily to in the places where people are starving. So um, one one problem at a time, I think one is, <laughs> one is the development of uh, technology and the other one is the distribution or the fair distribution yeah, of technology. Yeah, that's true. And that's disconnected. Yeah. I mean, when I think about SARS-CoV-2, um, what, what, what I really like is uh, the development speed that we saw with the vaccines. Um, I grew up in a world where you mentioned it also in the podcast. It took five, a minimum of five to ten years uh, from the lab bench with, uh, let's say, lead candidate up to the market. And uh, what we really saw in the last year is when everybody works together globally and wants to solve a problem. Uh, in a year, can be achieved a lot. If this is morally or ethically acceptable, it's a different question. But only to see that uh, the whole industry can unite and focus on solving one single goal in, in only 12 months and bring a novel vaccine to the patients. This is, this is amazing. And I hope that uh, it remains in our industry and also politicians and, and companies uh, continue supporting this collaboration. Because with that spirit, we can practically my opinion, solve a lot of diseases and a lot of problems. Um, the second part, of course, I mean, all the vaccines are on the market and now we see the distribution problematic. So that some countries can afford to uh, to get more vaccines and they start uh, vaccinating kids with a question if the risk-benefit profile really justifies that. Whereas the WHO points out that in uh, poorer countries or uh, not so rich countries, uh, healthcare workers don't have access to vaccines. And uh, this is the population that is highest at risk and uh, they would need that. So these are more political questions that we can also solve with a lot of debate and discussion. Uh, speaking about SARS-CoV-2, uh, let me just ask a blunt question. Is gene editing playing a role in vaccine development? Is this... Uh... Well, I would say not to a great extent. I mean, first, it, it, it did play a role relatively early on more for the um, discovery of targets. So hmm. when, when the virus first came out and nobody knew anything about the virus, um, something like a CRISPR screen, this is the technology that we use at Alien, can provide you very quickly with an understanding of the critical host proteins, so the critical human proteins that the virus needs to make a living, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, and that is what people did, you know, I would say within within two or three months, we had we had almost like a map um, of the virus as it as it sort of travels um, through cells and and sort of uses cells and and, and abuses cells um, to its own benefit, and that is important because it potentially highlights intervention points. It highlights points where we could start making a drug. Now, of course, then making a drug is again a laborious process. We've been very fast with the vaccine, essentially because the entire platform had been set up by BioNTech, right? That was, we were sort of in a particularly fortunate situation in that they had been building this mRNA platform, which was very scalable, easy to make very large amounts, um, and they had prepared this for some time, but the truth is they didn't really have a very good example where they could apply this, right? And, and they're now saying, oh, we want to be an immuno-oncology company. But the truth is that they were sort of waiting for a first example to be sort of the, the first test case that would show that, that the advantages of the platform. And I think, you know, then sort of SARS-CoV-2 came and they were immediately uh, sort of spot on and said that this is the sort of the use case we've been waiting for and will now show the world that we can do this. And then of course it was amazing execution and um, 
it was it was very well done with the vaccine development i would i'm not fully sure there is a lot um that that um crispr could have contributed um um again you know you could you sort of vaccine development is always has to do with with the immune response that the vaccine elicits so again one could one could take crispr screening technology to understand the the immune response as it as it um is elicited by the vaccine um a bit better to sort of um give an expectation of what's going to happen in the human body um but um yeah i i would say at least in sort of when this virus first came out and nobody knew about it that's where you know crispr was really powerful i mean as far as i remember um we have every three to five years such an event that new viruses um, appear somewhere in the world and uh, what i understand from from your explanation is that in such events uh, your technology that you have at alien biotechnology uh, can help to uh, let's say uh, unlock the secrets or discover the secrets or uncover the secrets of the virus what is the virus doing in the body which route does it take uh, back can you uh, find access points for therapies and that you can uh, shorten the length of the time um, until uh, this process is uh, is finished so this would be one point and also later on when vaccines are developed uh, as far as i understand your explanation uh, it also can help uh, your technology to understand what's the vaccine doing in the body and uh, is it really going down this, uh, the right route and uh, can help uh, the scientists to make the vaccines more effective in, in later generations. Is that uh, picture correct that I got? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, with the only caveat being that sort of the, the, the drug target nomination, I think for SARS-CoV-2 was, was something that's relatively quick. And of course, then the delivery of a, of a full drug discovery program is something that we're still sort of awaiting, right? Even, mm. you know, we've been very quick with the vaccine, but it will probably take, you know, at least one, if not three more years until we have a first drug that is a targeted treatment for the virus entering the clinic, right? That is usually a very laborious process and that really cannot be short-circuited. There is really a lot of tests that just need to be done and, even with all the excitement um, and, and all the concern that we have of, of this um, virus causing the pandemic, nobody would be willing to take shortcuts there, right? With the vaccine, it was a slightly different thing. We knew that the platform was relatively safe. You know, mRNA is a molecule that's quickly degraded. It does not integrate anywhere in the human body. So, so there, you know, people were, let's say, willing to, um, I, I wouldn't call it shortcuts because they have mm. done all the clinical testing sure. properly, but it's, but it's um, right there. People were willing to accelerate things with um, sort of more conventional drug discovery and more conventional drugs. This is just not possible. Yeah. Shortcuts is such a nasty word. It uh, uh, could, could uh, create the impression that work was not done properly. Um, when I look at the duration of uh, drug development, um, my opinion, it's uh, one one part that uh, takes a lot of time is fundraising. So when you look at the traditional model, I mean, uh, all the, the early stage development work usually happens in, in small biotech companies like yours, uh, not so much in the pharma industry anymore. Uh, and even if it happens in the pharma industry, you have this long decision making processes. Um, I think what I saw last year um, with my fundraising experience for vaccine companies from six, seven years ago, uh, that there was much more willingness to pay into high risk projects uh, in the vaccine space, which of course, I mean, if I got a billion uh, dollar um, cash in my bank account, I can develop a vaccine also in no time because I can hire all the right people. Looking back at the traditional fundraising process, um, it's, just comes in in chunks so it gets 10 million 20 million then another 50 million then you have all always a year in between uh where you have to talk with experts and uh go through the diligences and this of course uh, takes away resources for development so this mm -hmm. also adds time and this was completely gone in the last year uh the only thing that i saw is that all the money and all the political power was rooted into vaccine development and nothing happened on the therapeutic side so it's uh only recently that uh, Biden announced that uh, I think it was two weeks ago or one week ago 
that the United States allocates $3 billion into development of therapeutics. And I also hope that Europe is going down the same route because when we also would invest three billion, uh, it's basically six billion is the money that uh, we have to pay as a minimum to bring two therapies to the market. Uh, and if this six billion are really available and uh, easily available to scientists, uh, then I think also we can speed up the therapeutics development process. So this would just take one component out uh, that costs a lot of time. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I mean, the truth is that a lot of the therapeutic development happens in pharma companies, and and my feeling is if they're convinced about the indication and they're convinced that they want to go down that route, they they often have enough money. If it's if it happens outside a pharma company, then you're right. Money is is always short, right? It's also that you can hardly raise the amount of money that is needed for drug development. Hence. Sort of any startup um, typically has a has a handover point in mind, right? They, they they might say we have a therapeutic ambition in rheumatoid arthritis, but you know typically we would only go until a com- phase one that is completed, and then we need to find someone because if we if we then need to fund a phase two or even a phase three study out of our own pocket, it gets so incredibly expensive that very few people are willing to take that risk. So that you know you could. Um, potentially alleviate by making public money available um, um, to, to sponsor this. I mean, I agree with what you say when I look at phase three studies or market access or phase four studies. Um, pharma has enough money in that area. And I think this is also the, the part of the industry that works very well. Uh, what in my opinion also works very well, especially in Europe, is uh, basic research. Uh, everything that happens in research organizations, we have Horizon programs, we have uh, FWF in Austria, we have FFG in Austria and other other grant programs that help basic uh, researchers and scientists to move their science forward. Of course, I know uh, applying for grants is a nasty process and uh, I never met a scientist who was really happy about the process, but uh, of course, when the money comes in, it's great. And the good thing is in basic research, uh, scientists don't need billions. So they can do a lot with a few millions or a few hundred thousand euros. And this is also solved. What's really tricky and difficult in my opinion, and I still see a shortage, a shortage of uh, capital are the stages between. So mm. what happens between basic research and let's say the proof of concept in human studies uh, is a really complex value chain with a lot of players in it. Um, and most of them lack capital because on one hand, pharma doesn't really want to to tap into uncertain technologies. Uh, of course, I mean, when you have, uh, like, like CRISPR, yeah? when you have this uh, game-changing technology um, that is obvious, pharma is very willing to invest very early. But uh, a lot of inventions that are needed don't evolve out of game-changing technology. So sometimes there is this uninteresting technology, then you have... Uh, by pure chance, a finding, and it makes it hot. So, and in this area, also VCs don't really want to invest. They don't want to pick up technology, form a team, and have to go through this uh, company formation process. Um, on the other hand, uh, business angels, what, what I see in the digital uh, world, um, expect usually a return within one or two years. So drug development is not really an attractive model for business angels. And uh, also the public side doesn't really want to invest there. And I believe if from this uh, $3 billion from from Biden and also if we take uh, money from the European Union, if they would really start focusing uh, in this complex, let's uh, call it uh, tech transfer processes or value of death, like, it, like it's called in finance, um, if they would allocate more money there, I think also a lot of uh, companies would be enabled to move far, uh, faster and quicker. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, it's it's not only a function of money, I would, I would add here. I mean, as you rightfully pointed out, there are different programs and that are available, but it's it's really, if you are thinking big and drug development always has to be thought of as, as a really very big and international game, then you have to think very international. This shouldn't be thought as a local local play. I mean, you know all the numbers as, a, as an investor. I mean, typically these East Coast companies are started with 50 million plus and, and that's the kind of 
play you have to compete with as a, also as an Austrian startup. So you have to think very carefully mm. where you want to get your funds funds from. And, and this is the kind of competition and, and play you're, you're into. So I'm not 100% sure whether kind of these public programs really can can replace uh, private funding. It's, it's a fact that Europe is somehow different than the US here. The capital markets are not, not as evolved as in the US. That's the reason why the Austrian drug developers, if they really become big, uh, look for a second or, or first listing at, at the US capital market because simply there is much more more liquidity there yeah. and, and and more and and more but maybe also more educated investor base i mean when i worked in this financing scheme scene uh, uh, many cases i saw that the the kind of investors that really could judge what is a good investment in the life science area is a kind of scarce Resource. I mean, it has been. It's much better now in in the IT space, but in biotech, it's still, at least compared to the US, it's a kind of uh, limited, limited number of people that really are able to understand deeply what what the drug drug discovery company is about, and and really to give a a clear opinion whether it's worth to to be listed on a, on a capital market on market or not. Yeah, my friends asked me in 2006 if I'm not. This is that you're going in the life science industry. They pretty much uh, said the same what what you are telling me now. Um, I think Europe is a great place to start a company, even in drug development, drug discovery, thanks to some uh, public funding programs, and they make it really possible for scientists that don't have deep pockets. I mean, let's face it, there are mm-hmm. not millions of billionaires on the market <laughs> or yeah. in the world. So you can also do a lot with 100 to 200,000 euros, uh, given the fact that uh, public money flows into that area. When you look at the venture scene, I think it's a, it's a directional decision by the founders that they have to make. Do they want to play the European single technology play of venture capitalists? Um, there is not enough money in Europe, especially in, uh, in preclinical development and clinical development. So the reaction of the VCs in Europe that I mostly saw was that they want to have a single asset in a single company, develop it to clinics, and then sell it as quickly as possible to the pharma industry. It's mm. a just approach. It's um, I, I don't want to complain about it. But uh, when I look on the United States, especially on uh, key players also in gene editing, um, they have more a visionary approach, uh, like mm-hmm. CRISPR therapeutics, for example. I mean, it was founded in Switzerland, but basically financed in the United States, in my opinion. And uh, it's, it's listed on the NASDAQ and uh, mm-hmm. also gets a lot of uh, US money. Uh, when founders uh, want to follow a visionary approach with, a, a let's say, a portfolio approach in the company with running a pipeline of 10, 20 programs, I don't, I don't see the, the right environment in Europe. I see the United States as uh, the right uh, cultural environment for such yeah. ambitions. I agree, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't see it that negative. I mean, if we look at BioNTech and other very mm. prominent uh, German examples, I mean, I mean, there are people with deep pockets like like Mr. Hopp and, and the Strongman, Strongman guys. They, they are around and they, they significantly help the, these, these German, German unicorn companies to really develop very well. And also in Austria, we have in the meantime, we have good examples of, of companies developing very well, like you know, Hookkeeper and others. Mm. I mean, yeah, one can always discuss whether, yeah, uh, they were not Hookkeeper, but others were sold too early. Yeah, that's... That's uh, and and did not get the full value of the of, of what what they would be able to 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 develop. But yeah, that's that's as it is. But when, when uh, and and in addition, yeah, uh, even if you are kind of company that started in Austria, you have the chance of getting listed in another market, be it UK, be it US, that has more liquidity and raise raise more funds there. I mean. We have several examples now where Vienna is kind of the R and D and hub of, of certain companies. Even U.S. companies come mm-hmm. to to Austria and, and create the the R and D uh, department, R and D kind of yeah 
part here in, in Austria because we have so good a base, base of, of doing, doing R&D here and maybe do the commercial functions elsewhere. That could also be, be a model. In the end, it's always, and this was also mentioned last time, a function of, of experience of people that are around and available in, in our country and, and in, in Europe on a bigger scale. No, that's true. And I see is also the upside that uh, especially our business can can be easily run globally. You mentioned Okipa Pharma. I think Okipa Pharma started in Switzerland, then relocated to Vienna and uh, got listed on the Nasdaq and has now uh, subsidiaries in the United States. So I think the headquarter in the United States and still the, the research is done here in Austria. Also, I think Nabriva is an example, um, mm. started in Vienna and then got listed on the Nasdaq. Uh, Biontech, I uh, think financed by, by Mick and uh, their investors who helped to evolve the company with significant investments, partnered up with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who also brought money in. And I think Biontech is also listed on the Nasdaq. Um, so mm -hmm. it just must be clear that uh, at one point in time, when we're looking for 500 million, I still think that there yeah. are only very, very few investors here in Europe who uh have the capabilities of supporting that and i always wonder if when the european life science industry evolves especially with uh, the successes of biontech or keeper pharma that hopefully also we will get more and more investors that are located in uh, in europe and yeah. fuel the talent no i definitely agree i mean all this corona corona phase definitely improved the case for good life science and biotech companies i think This has increased the investor confidence a lot and, and made a very good case for, for investors that biotech and life science companies uh, are, uh, are, that are uh, well deserve uh, good, good investments. And Talk. I mean, we as, we as a as biotech scene in Austria also yeah, have some room for improvement, but yeah, with the, Now, with the creation of the Biotech Austria Association, I really think that's a, a great step forward to also receive better public uh, uh, knowledge in the in the and the kind of yeah, what what the biotech uh, companies can do for the for the society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we have room for improvement. Otherwise, life would get boring easily. So <laughs> if there's nothing to do anymore. Um, talking about investments and, and pharmaceutical companies, what are the major players in your industry? What are the major players uh, in gene editing these days? I mean, obviously we have, you, it was already mentioned several times, CRISPR Therapeutics definitely is one of the, the large players and, and all the other Companies that are yeah mainly in the US for now like Intelia, mm -hmm. uh, but there are also some some companies in in Asia. But uh, yeah, and uh, I mean many also big pharma companies have now taken licenses for for CRISPR technology from the different licensing consortia, and and probably follow their own approaches. So I think CRISPR technology in the meantime is so broad a technology that that it cannot be can be centered around uh, single companies. That's definitely too big a topic. I yeah. mean, we haven't discussed the IP landscape yet, which is still stands in the way a bit of a, a even better development, a more, more efficient development of the whole CRISPR technology and, and CRISPR drug development scene, because as we all know, this is still somehow unclear how this whole IP battle will, will be resolved in the end. Yeah, that was that was, uh, that, that was my comment as well. That initially there were sort of two, three big companies that were founded around the main patent estates, and the two competing ones here are the Charpentier Doudna um, patent that go back to the dis sort of initial discovery that I described earlier, and then the reduction to practice in human cells, which was Fang Zhang from the from the Broad Institute, and and sort of companies were founded around those main patent estates. Initially, you know, Editas uh, was founded um, around the Fang Zhang uh, portfolio and then CRISPR Therapeutics and um, Intelia around the, around the Doudna uh, Charpentier um, portfolio. But it, it seems in the meantime, you know, a lot of other companies have come up and this question of who owns CRISPR and 
and you need to have access to the foundational IP because the technology is so groundbreaking and so important has become almost, a, I wouldn't say a mute point, but, you know, in the early days of CRISPR, people were like, okay, you know, you, you need to be either this or that company because those are the two main patent estates. And if you don't have access, you don't even need to play in that market. But in the meantime, you know, there are 15 other companies is my impression. And um, eventually the, the whole IP situation will be sorted out because it's so big and so broad and there's so many applications that, that, it just cannot be in the way that um, two universities are battling over over that foundational IP. I mean, I think as long as long as uh, the companies are developing or, or doing research, the IP should not be the problem uh, until market entry. And I really wonder what happens when the first company has uh, developed a therapy that works, um, and it cannot brought to patients because of IP protection. So, because uh, there is an unwillingness of uh, uh, giving handing out licenses, it would be an interesting case uh, to see how that will be resolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot really see that happen. First, the question is always sort of what exactly was claimed in these patents. That mm -hmm. is, right. Initially, for instance, um, yeah, I mean, let's not go into detail there, but but there, you know, the, the the precise formulation around the claims matters whether you're whether you're inside mm -hmm. or outside. So. Um, I think that there can potentially be workarounds. We've seen different nucleases other than Cas9 that are, that could potentially be used. So I think there will be several technical solutions to the to the um, to the to solve um, um, the problems that you're trying to solve. So I I would be really surprised if that ultimately was in the way. Also, I wonder if then you know University of uh, Vienna or Berkeley or or anyone would really like to see their name in the news stating that the, you know a new therapy for cystic fibrosis becomes available but you're blocking it because you because people don't have access to crispr i mean that is very negative pr and i'm really hoping that it doesn't go down that path because it would be um it, it would be a sort of very tragic if that was the outcome right i can sort of see how you want to have certain stakes in the ground. I can also see how you want to sh have a share in the program if CRISPR is used to, to, to sort of make, make um, uh, or break the therapy. But, um, but it, 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 we hopefully we're not seeing or we're not facing a situation where a therapy gets shot down essentially because people don't have the proper licenses in place. I, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm too positive. I, But uh, as long as it's research, um, DIP is never a problem, in my opinion. Um, if there is really a groundbreaking uh, breakthrough that also coming from, from the investment side, also when I look at uh, companies that uh, have not secured the license, uh, once you have the results, of course, I mean, out of courtesy, you should talk with the university who holds DIP and uh, agree on licensing terms that are also beneficial for the basic researchers to move that forward. But I think the the licensing terms are quite standard these days and there are a lot of examples in the world so that uh, also when a licensing agreement cannot be found, I think with, with outside pressure from regulatory authorities uh, that might also be resolved beneficial for both parties. It might not be uh, the lottery win, but uh, mm. I think it can be resolved and I don't see a reason why a university should not um, give a license on commercial terms, uh, but they should... No. Uh, It would make the money. Or am I too positive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think this getting a therapeutic license for CRISPR is, is a very complicated process. So it's on the one side, the universities and, and the mm -hmm. people involved have given this to certain specialized companies that commercialize this, this IP. On the other side, I think you mentioned some are mandatory licenses, which are in certain patent laws. But we have this discussion with corona uh, vaccinations as well. And, and we have seen the discussions there. I mean, mandatory licenses, that's really, this goes deep into the heart of our uh, kind of uh, commercial system and the biotech system. So and, and I don't think there will be an, an easy solution to that because this really would significantly impact the whole business model of biotech companies uh, in, a, in a sense that, yeah, They cannot rely on the proper patent protection they absolutely need for commercializing their 
products they have, have discovered. I mean, the main problem we have these days is that it's not even clear to whom the, the knowledge belongs because we have this interference process going on. We have several uh, several uh, rulings going on at the EPO, uh, European Patent Office. Uh, so this will, unless there is a, a kind of uh, solution and uh, via negotiation, if it's decided by court, this I would assume this will take several years and this, this is really resolved. And this will also lead to a, a situation where investors and companies will shy away from this unclear situation and will not develop uh, certain therapeutics where it, the, the licensing situation is unclear. Because if I am an investor, I wouldn't invest in a case where, where it's unsure whether I can, can commercialize uh, so technology. I think that's a question worth debating. Um, when I think uh, about the origins of patent laws, um, they all evolved in a time where the internet did not exist, where traveling was really difficult and challenging. Um, and also multinational collaborations were not uh, in the day-to-day -day business. It was just, I think, 1800, 1700, 1600. So they have a very, very long history. Mm -hmm. And now we live in a connected world where it's really possible, also with, with more and more people on the planet, where it's really possible to, to connect huge teams uh, on one top, over one topic and let them work to solve the same problem. So, and still we have these negotiation processes that just take a lot of time. And uh, coming basically are coming from a different society, from a different background. And when I think um, also from the investment side, when I think uh, just, just, just start working, to just move the therapy forward, I mean, nine out of 10 or 99 out of 100 uh, approaches won't work anyways. So uh, should people start uh, negotiating a license for a patent that probably is off patent uh, before they can bring even bring something on the market uh, early on? Or should they just postpone the process and say, okay, let's find out first if it works. And if it works, then let's initiate the process and sometimes mm -hmm. get also hopefully help in future that maybe there is an arbitrage authority that can help uh, just shorten the timeline for the negotiation, not in, uh, let's say, uh, denying uh, uh, commercial benefits to one party, but just to streamline the process and make it move yeah. quicker. I think this would be very helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of relatively cheap processes up to going into clinical phases. I was mm -hmm. really talking about clinical studies that, that cost several hundred millions yeah. and, and more. And I think taking this huge commercial risk of entering such studies without having a clear situation on, on the whether an, an approval would be possible in the end with a proper license situation. Yeah, I doubt that this risk can be taken easily. The the because question. I think also of the, the licensing partner, if he knows that you absolutely need his license, he will have a very strong leverage of of, uh, of setting the bar for, for a proper license very high. I mean, it, it, it's not in our industry, but I think uh, the developer of Fortnite is battling uh, over the access on, 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 on uh, Apple's App Store, which is basically a monopoly and patents create monopolies. Um, I'm not aware of a case that really pushed it so far that they just developed something up to the end of phase three, invested uh, billions of dollars without sorting out the licensing issues beforehand. But the question would really be, what would happen then? I mean, you have a therapy in the pipeline that works. Um, mm -hmm. And then the owner of the patent just blocks it and says, no, <laughs> no, I don't allow it. It would be really interesting to... to to have a debate over that. Uh, I mean, SARS I mean, brought it up. <laughs> there's a huge debate in the US anyway going on about this, these patents uh, in, the, in the CRISPR space, whether they belong to a bigger extent to the public, because obviously a lot of the research that led to this breakthrough uh, discoveries was financed by public funds and, and in the end by the public and, and whether the, the huge profits then should remain with the with the large university funds is definitely a big question and, and should be should be considered carefully yeah, because this is is somehow unequal distribution of profit. Thomas Tillman, I I really like having conversations, so we can go on uh, also for another three hours, and I, no. think I will never run out of ideas. 
<laughs> don't don't threaten anyone here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I think uh, you have two companies to run, and uh, so I would suggest to wrap up our discussion. And I would like to ask uh, you two one final question. You both have experience in the industry. You founded several companies. And uh, there are so many people out there these days who think about uh, going down the same routes that you did, um, but it's their first time. So let's just assume somewhere at the conference, hopefully in future again in person, uh, you pump into a bunch of entrepreneurs um, from different age groups in their 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s who come up with their tea and um, tell you, look, I'm so impressed by what you achieved. I want to do something similar, I have an idea. Uh, can you please give me one advice? What would that most important advice to those people be from you? That's a tough one, Thomas. I leave you the first one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, for, me, for me, it's it's relatively clear. I think the, the best advice would be to, to really form a proper team, to team up with people whom you can trust and who bring in different competencies, different networks. And if you have built a great team of two or three people, then, then that's already one of the best bases you can have for forming a, a, a successful and, and sustainable, sustainable company. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think it's a very tough question. Um, you put me a bit on the spot, <laughs> but I don't know. I would I would probably advise to really, you know, first try to try to be very specific about what you want to do and try to really focus on a very small thing. But then with this very small thing, try to try to develop an idea that you really think has an impact. So this whole this whole concept of focus, I think, is one that we always try to emphasize that we're trying to do one thing really, really well, as opposed to working at a lot of uh, disconnected or loosely connected um, things. But I'm not sure I find that a very good piece of advice. So I'm, uh, it would have to be a longer conversation for it to be meaningful, I think. We, we can make another podcast on that, but, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you nailed it very, very well. Focus is the most important thing for um, success of any company. And later on, when you succeed in one field, you can then, of course, diversify and uh, grow bigger like Amazon. But Amazon initially, uh, I think it's a company everybody knows. They did just one thing, selling books over the internet. That's it. And both advice is uh, form a team and uh, focus initially on one idea, become the best in that field uh, is what made Jeff Bezos the richest person in the world, ultimately, after 27 years. <laughs> so sound advice from you too. Thank you very much for your time and these nice conversations. Uh, I think it helped a lot for non-scientists to understand better what gene editing is, what the power of CRISPR is, what uh, the risks and opportunities are and also hopefully we contributed a bit uh, to the awareness of the life science industry and hopefully also one or the other politician is uh, listening to that and helps uh, moving forward the regulations around patent laws and help um, also with bringing the right laws in place that our community here in Europe can evolve better. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Thanks a lot for organizing that. Have a nice day. Thank you. It's a great day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. <laughs>